plow through some electric twangers today. Up first, we have this Orville by Gibson guitar. What the heck is that? Some of you folks might not know about these, as they were never marketed in North America. This is a Japanese Gibson product. Huh? What? Yeah. Gibson had a relationship with Japanese guitar makers in the 80s and 90s, the same way that Fender did. It's well known that Gibson transferred its Epiphone division to Japan in the early 70s. The instruments there were built by the Aria Corporation, and they were sold in the U.S. as well as Japan and other places. That partnership ended in the early 80s, at which point Gibson moved production, its Epiphone production, to Korea. However, distribution of Gibson product in Japan continued. It was picked up by the Yamano Gaki Company, and in 1988, it was decided to create a mid-range line of guitars for sale in Japan, with a price point between the Korean-made Epiphones and the U.S.-made Gibsons. And they decided to call it Orville, after the founder of Gibson, Orville Gibson. Um, these were made in Japan with some Gibson components, like the pickups are the same as a Gibson. I think they may have been aimed at sort of curbing the demand for fake Gibsons, um, these were more in reach for your average Japanese player, and the operation ended in 1998, so it lasted 10 years. This is a very nice ES-335 style guitar, in great condition, heavy, feels heavier than your average 335. Uh, there's only one thing that's disappointing, that is the nut. It's been fooled around with, and somebody has put a great big shim under it. The shim is so thick you wonder what the heck happened there, because it couldn't have been playable without it at any point. So we're going to fix that and make a new bone nut. We'll have a look at the usual measurements just to make sure everything is kind of okay. Just about 4 ths on the base side. Action on the treble side is slightly lower, about 3 and a half, closer to 4 ths So that's um, a good average kind of action. And the relief is about nine thousandths. It doesn't say made in Japan on the label, or anywhere on the guitar that I can see. I don't see any country of manufacture. Looking at the way the nut is functioning, if I fret between the second and third fret here, and check out the air gap between the bottom of the string and the top of the first fret, there is perhaps a little more room than necessary, especially on the bass strings, but it's not too far out. Uh, let's do a quick measurement there and see what it is. And it's somewhere around 25 thousandths, which again is not too bad for a, you know, a factory setup. I would prefer to see 21 or 22 thousandths. Okay, we'll see how well this thing is glued in. There's a bit of a gap along the back edge, but I run my knife in there, and yeah, there is actually quite a lot of glue in there, which is no excuse. There's no need to glue both sides of a nut into the guitar. Um, that's just... You can put some on the underside if you must, but I usually limit mine to the front face of the nut. Because when I go and hammer this off, it's not going to do any damage to the end grain surface of the fingerboard here. Glued into the back, um, well, it could pop a bunch of lacquer off is the, the main thing. Um, or even damage the face veneer of the headstock. I'll go along and try and, oh, there we go. Put the knife in the seam between the shim and the nut. And I don't know what that material is. It may be plastic. Actually, I think that might be one of those bone shims Stuart McDonald started selling some time ago. And it's well and truly glued in place. A lot of super glue. A 
I measure the width of the nut and it varies a bit but it's somewhere around 190, 192 thousandths. I'll measure the little trough here. It seems to widen from about 190 thousandths on the base side up to closer to 198, 200 thousandths on the treble. Um, had a question about my dowel calipers and which ones do I prefer and it really doesn't matter. If it's less than a hundred bucks they're all basically the same. Um, you could go out and spend huge amounts of money on Mitutoyo or um, Starrett calipers but for woodworking purposes and stuff that we're doing here in the shop and for the amount of time that this spends getting dusty and dirty I think I paid 39 bucks for these and they're fine. Okay, I've got a bone blank here which I've thinned down on my drum sander to just over 200 thousandths and I've been sanding on a flat block here. So I've got the one side fits nicely. Um, rather than try and taper the blank I'm actually going to try and remove a small amount of material on the base side here and even it up a little bit more. It's difficult in this case because there's actually sort of a ridge of finish. It looks like this was sprayed with the nut in place and um, it kind of humps up towards the line of the, the nut. And, uh, you know, that's that can be kind of fragile. Already some finish loss in one corner here. But I'm going to try and make that a little bit more uniform with a safe edge file. Being very delicate. That fits nice and snugly. I'm using a mechanical pencil to mark the width. I've strengthened the pencil lines with a square and now I can use a small razor saw also known as an exacto saw. I saw to the outside of the pencil line like this, um, I'm actually introducing about uh, half a millimeter's worth of extra width into this thing, which is fine because that extra amount is going to go away when I sand it. When I'm doing this cut, I'm sighting along the top as well as the line that's uh, facing me here. So, I can knock off the preliminary saw marks with some 150 grit on this flat block. Striving to maintain the angle which I've just sawn because uh, on this nut it splays out to accommodate the angle of the headstock. Now that I have the width pretty much dialed in, here's a little subtlety. This is the face of the nut which contacts the edge of the fingerboard and uh, that corner down there tends to collect glue and if there's any debris in that corner it'll hold the nut out from um, the fingerboard and can cause issues. So what I do is I go along with the file here and I just knock that inner corner off making a small chamfer um, keeping the very ends square and this will account for any bits of wood fiber or glue or stuff that might hold that corner apart. I believe they call this an engineering corner. Like that. Yeah, that's pretty close to ideal. There's just a little hair's breadth on either side which I will knock back in sanding. It's just about where I want it. 600 grit 1200 grit, 2400 grit, 4000, 6000, and 
8,000. That'll be sufficient. I can also lightly polish the back side of the nut as well, which rarely gets seen, but it's nice if it's shiny too. Okay, I'll use the half pencil on the fret tops. This gives me a guideline. So I'm going to use my uh, jeweler's saw to cut about eh, 30 to 40 thousandths above that line. When using the nut slotting files, if I go down to that line, there'll usually be a couple of more strokes to get me into the region of perfect. So I can remove most of the excess bone on the top of the nut now, so I won't have to file through it. Checking out the spacing on this nut, the actual nut width is 1 and 11 sixteenths is nice. It's about 43 millimeters. Um, on the wider side as these things go, definitely an early 60s rather than the late 60s width. Um, and fairly generous margins between the edge of the fingerboard and the center line of the outside strings. The 135 thousandths is more than an eighth of an inch, just over three millimeters. And the string spacing outside E to outside E is around 35 and a half millimeters which is um, again fairly narrow. You know, I'm going to set them at one eighth of an inch from either side which is my usual measurement which I think feels right to most people. So the string spacing from outside E to outside E is going to be 1.420 <laughs> um, which means if I divide that by five I'm going to end up with um, 284 thousandths between strings. Okay, with the nut in place here, especially for Gibson guitars, the interior strings here really do need to be angled up to the front surface of the nut, so I'm touching the um, straight edge to the inside of the tuner shaft. and I'll make a line there so that these are angled towards those shafts. This can help a little bit with uh, some of the tuning stability that Gibson guitars are renowned for not possessing. Um, frankly, I, I don't notice it to be such a big problem. Make a little nick on the line with a scalpel blade. This will help the saw get started. It also blunts the scalpel blade. I've got the scalpel braced against my thumb here so that I don't inadvertently go into my own palm, which slows down the workflow. Then comes the razor saw. player likes 10 to 46 strings, so we'll get those started here. It's just quicker and easier to do that off the guitar. Also preliminarily shaped the ends of the nut. I'm just going to put a couple of little daubs of super glue on the end grain surface. of the fingerboard. It doesn't have to be huge gobs of it. And then get that positioned. We'll measure the gap here. It's got to come down about four or five thousandths. I'm maintaining the same angle as the headstock. Uh, what you definitely don't want is a situation where the file drops down towards the front side of the nut so that there's a gap. Um, you want a very definite takeoff at the very front edge. If you don't have that, you can end up with some weird buzzes and intonation problems. Protect the edges of the headstock where it scoops in like this uh, with some heavy cards so the strings aren't digging into the lacquer there. I'm just going to polish this up with some fine sandpaper. If 
there are sharp edges along the corner of the nut. I'll lightly round those over using a safe edge file. Also be sure to sand the top point of the nut where it takes off. Uh, not a whole lot, but just enough to keep it from being sharp under the fingers. I also polish the bottoms of the slots with some 600 and 1200 grit sandpaper. This goes a long way towards smooth tuning. And finally, I relieve the back corners of the string slots with a small rat tail file. This eases the string's transition into the nut. There are a number of lubricating compounds sold for this, but I like regular old graphite pencil lead. Just for interest's sake, I'm going to see if this is a 5 16 nut. And it appears to be. Give that a little tweak. Tighten the rod just a bit. Okay, I'm going to polish the frets on this thing. Now we got to go through all the different Luthery jokes about nuts. Or not. Oh, there we have it. One bone nut. Um, things about it. The slots are highly polished. There's not a whole lot of string stuck underneath the surface of the nut. You really only need half the diameter. And in fact, Gibson's much maligned tuning issues, um, a lot of that goes away if you shape the nut in such a way that it's not burying the strings under the surface. Uh, this, you know, half the diameter, the top two strings are their full diameter in, because those ones tend to be more easy to pull out. But other than that, uh, yeah, there's not a lot of excess material. Um, and it's ready to play. Let's do a Les Paul, a bona fide USA made Gibson product. This is obviously a gold top from the second era of its manufacture. Gold tops were of course the original finish of the Les Paul model as it was released back in 1952. That was available until 1958 when they came out with the sunburst finish that everyone kind of likes for some reason. A couple of years later they decided to completely redesign the Les Paul into what we now call the SG and these things went away. So for most of the 1960s you couldn't buy a guitar that looked like this. But in the interim of course a number of prominent rock artists started playing the old ones. Eric Clapton, Jeff Beck, Keith Richards, Peter Green, uh, Mike Bloomfield, Jimmy Page. Um, someone told this to Gibson. Why, people like the old design now. We should start making them again. It's 1968. I mean, what those people really wanted was a sunburst standard from 1959. But what Gibson gave them was a gold top with P90s. Insert the deflating trombone sound here. But, you know, I guess this was better than nothing. However, after that first year, dealers kind of complained a little bit. People want the other one, with the humbuckers, gosh darn it. And in 1969, apparently after they had a bunch of bodies already routed out for soap bar P90 pickups, Gibson went and said, okay, we'll use these smaller mini humbuckers that we designed for the Epiphone guitars, because production is about to move to Japan anyway, and we're going to be stuck with a bunch of those kicking around here. So we'll do that. We'll fit a pickup into the P90 route. And with that they created the Deluxe. Because mini buckers are, in their eyes, a bit of an upgrade from the P90. Because they're quieter. Now this individual here is a little bit difficult to pin down for certain on dates. 
because the Les Paul serial number sequence is a bit hit and miss in this time period. But judging from the serial number, I'm guessing this is 1970. It's got six digits, it's got the Made in the USA stamp, and the number is in the 1000s. So, you know, it's also got period typical features. You know, this has got the um, volute on the back of the headstock, which was coming in at this point. Uh, this is the thing that people contend will stop Gibson necks from breaking, which of course it doesn't. This one has been broken at least once, and probably twice. This has also got the two-layer stacked laminated body called the Pancake Body. This guitar was owned and played for many years by David Baxter, who was a Toronto music fixture for decades. Um, he unfortunately passed away just last fall. Um, he played in a whole bunch of different bands. He was a producer, a session man, had his own studio, uh, songwriter. He's also a talent scout. Like He had a hand in the early emerging stages of a whole bunch of different artists, many of whom I really like. I saw him play about 20 years ago, kind of by chance. He's just a seriously good guitarist. This has been bequeathed to one of his longtime bandmates, who, even though she's a drummer, wants to make sure it's in really decent shape, uh, being a piece of great sentimental value, as you can imagine. I want to check out the headstock cracks. You know, there's one there I think might need a bit of shoring up. The setup is uh, pretty stiff. It's about five and a half sixty fourths, which is eighty five thousandths, about two point one millimeters. And I'd like to see that come down, at least on the treble side, a bit. Um, there is a bit of extra relief in the neck. It's bowed somewhat. Um, the relief is up around 16 thousandths at the 6th and 7th fret. Uh, and then there's the pick guard. This has got some cracks in it that I worry might continue to spread. This one especially. You know, if it goes too much farther, big chunks are going to fall off. So we might see if we can reinforce those from the underside. I don't know, this one may have been previously glued. We'll find out. Don't send me the picture of your 2019 Les Paul Studio that's got one tiny little scratch like that that needs desperately to be fixed. This is the way they should look, people. Nothing seems to have been messed with in here. I might be able to get a date code off that one tone pot. Maybe, if I brush it for a while. Just use a little naphtha here. Okay, 137-7408, which makes this younger than we suspected. This would be made in the 8th month of 1974. Get some cleaner in there. Don't like that. That pot wiggles around a bit, needs to be tightened up. And this pot here seems to have spun around a little bit at some point, such that this cap is stretched to its limit. Uh, it's lucky it didn't go any farther. I want to get this one back close to where it should be. And be careful with these older knobs. I mean, they do get brittle. This one is missing a chunk. Loosen this slightly. And we'll rotate it back a little bit. See, this has got a replacement roller style bridge, which is probably a good idea when you're dealing with big Bigsby's, because they do tend to chew right through standard Gibson saddles at a phenomenal rate. Um, there is an issue, though, sometimes, in that these tend to rock backwards and forwards a little bit uh, when you're playing with the bar. Um, they'll rock forward, and then hopefully they come back to the same spot they were previously. Bigsby people know this and understand it and somehow manage to make it work. Um, because there is a certain amount of play, just due to the adjustable nature of these things and the threads. Uh, and also there can be some slight discrepancy between the string post and the holes that they fit into. Sometimes I can put a little bit of brass shim stock or something like that to make them a snugger fit. However, you know, it is kind of just one of those things. These are fairly chunky strings. I think they're 11 to 49s. You really want to be careful with this. I'm certain it's broken through here. I just hope it wasn't like glued directly to the top. And I'm going to leave the bracket on. Mm. 
Okay, it's got some tape on it. That's interesting. I'm going to clean this area a little bit. It's already got grunge down in the cracks, and there's really no way of getting that out at this point without snapping the thing in two. I'm going to run some thin glue down the inside of the crack. Which again, because of the amount of sweat and other things which have infiltrated, probably won't do very much, but it's a start. I'll clean this side as well. There's evidence of previous super glue repair on here. Use a little medium viscosity glue on this side just to hold it in place. Yes, you can purchase aftermarket guards that match this one remarkably well. However, that, that might not be the right thing for a guitar which is sort of a memorial piece. I've got some of this carbon fiber toe, T-O-W. It's like uh, a loose bundle of hair, essentially, uh, made of carbon fiber strands, which I will um, use across the joint in a number of places here in a technique not unlike what they do for fine art restoration when they've got a canvas uh, that has a split in it or it's been torn. I'll go along on the back side with uh, strands of linen and uh, bind it up that way. This is basically like an internal kind of suture using some epoxy. I'll just scuff sand the areas a little bit to rough them up. I'll just saturate this with the epoxy. Try not to get it all over my fingers. I mean you can try to be neat with this, but it usually doesn't work out. Okay, now that that's solidified, good and sturdy, I can flex it and it's not going to break apart. Still obviously previously broken, but that's the way it is. Okay, uh, in terms of the cracks here, I'm just giving this a little bit of a clean so I can see what's going on. Um, this area here is stripped of finish. I guess maybe it got sanded through during previous repairs, but I mean the area is filthy. There was an initial break I imagine, right here, I see this line, then a secondary break here, and at some point another break along here. Um, so it, it seems to have been broken three times, despite the volute. This one looks ugly, but as far as I can tell, it's rock solid. It's not going anywhere. It just happened to glue up a little bit out of alignment on the very corner. Not a whole lot I can do about that. This one here, which goes through the uh, tuner screw, I think that might actually be open a little bit. So we'll probably get some glue in there. Actually, just looking at this area here, which is quite a bit darker than the surroundings, I believe that's probably a touch-up um, from a time when the headstock was likely darker than it is now. Some of these things lighten as they age. So I think that's probably wiped on at some point. Try and get as much gunk out of the line of this nasty crack here. The most obvious one. In fact, I might go back with a knife um, and just try and pull out some of the real grunge. Now, if you're going to play a Les Paul a lot, if you're going to tour with one, especially, you sort of have to resign yourself to the fact that. It is going to, at some point, probably hit the stage. If you leave it on a stand, someone's going to come by and it's going to knock over. Uh, that's just part of the game. You can see this thing has had uh, 
new tuners installed at some point. These are Grovers. I'm just going to flood this crack. It's not very long, but I just want to make sure it's sealed up there. Now, this is also a period when Gibson was laminating the headstock out of multiple pieces. So the other thing I'm going to do is try and get some glue into that humped up area. See, capillary action just draws it along. This is some 600 grit sandpaper. And I'm just going to sort of wet sand that area while the glue is still flowy. Try and force a little dust in there. get rid of the ridged feeling. Okay, now I'll pat on a little bit of shellac here just to seal the area up. Of course you can still see it, but it's much less obtrusive than it was. You can't feel it anymore. So that's a lot more reassuring. Okay, this has been refretted at some point. Um, a slightly wider wire. They would have been sort of almost jumbos originally, about 103 thousandths in width, and these are 110. So this is a modern jumbo wire. Some of these could use a little bit of a recrown. They're a bit flat. Polishing, polishing, polishing. We can see a line of glue has been cast in place there along the top arch of the truss rod cavity opening. And we'll see how much of a nut is left on there. There is enough to turn. That's good. Well, okay, all set to go. All the history's still in there. And yeah, it's a 70s Les Paul. It feels like it weighs around 11, 12 pounds. Thank you.